Hi students, this is the second part of the module one presentation and we're looking at population pyramids. We looked at, just looked at population pyramids from three high fertility, high total fertility countries, Mali, Somalia, and Angola. Now we're going to look at three examples of median total fertility rate populations, looking at Mexico, India, and Indonesia. Once again, these come from populationpyramid.net, highlighted on the bottom of the slide. And as you can see, um, these pyramids are from countries whose population growths are substantially lowering. You can see how these pyramids have a much more narrow base, which indicates that they, the uh, population is more stable. People are living a little bit longer, and there are less children being born all at once. So they're instituting some form of birth control or control in the country. And now we are looking at an exam three examples of um, low total fertility rate countries. We look at Japan, Germany, and Russia. And this is a different type of population pyramid. Remember the high total fertility rates look like uh, triangles. The medium total fertility rates were um, a smaller, a narrower base, but still pointed. Now, the low total fertility rates almost look like a Coke bottle there. If you look at Japan, it almost looks like a Coke bottle. But you can see less children are being born. People are living to be ripe old ages. And it's almost turning into like a square block or so. You can see there's many more older people than younger people. And a big issue in Japan is that they have so many older people, they don't know what to do with them. They don't usually have nursing homes. They tr keep their parents and grandparents in their home. They all live together as a form of respect. But there are so many elders now that they're starting to um, develop more nursing homes. And this is a, a, a sign of... Um, it's, uh, the, the, the families are falling apart because they just can't take care of their, their elders anymore. It's a, it's a real challenge to their culture at this time of, uh, of life and development within their country. Um, the second level of our transitions, we looked at demographic, looking at the population pyramids, and now we're looking at um, the epidemiologic transition which is um, a sh shifting from a hard burden of death due to infections and things like diabe uh, diarrhea toward a high burden from chronic non-communicable diseases. That's we call that call them NCDs, NCDs, non-communicable diseases that occur as a population becomes more higher income. And every population is health concerns, but the mix of the most pressing problems changes over time as the country goes through this transition. And uh, then we look at the nutrition transition. This is the third. We looked at uh, demographic, epidemiologic, and now nutrition. So there's a shift from undernutrition, from people starving to death, not eating any meat, um, to overnutrition, as populations become, uh, if they have more money, they're able to buy um, sugary foods, luxury, luxury foods, um, more meats. People become heavier. Obesity becomes a real challenge. And I love this next slide. The overweight prevalence in Southeast Asia for adults of both sexes with a BMI. Look at that BMI. In um, Thailand is 32.2. Look at Malaysia, 44.2. And I always share the story. I'll hear this many, many times. When I first went to Thailand after college, I uh, couldn't buy clothes in any stores because I was too large and I was a size four. But they just did not have clothes for such a large body. The ties were all so thin and slim. Um, they ate only what they needed. They were very, very healthy, not a lot of sugar. And each time I go back to Thailand, I realize, gosh, there's a, someone who's overweight. Whereas when I lived there for four years, I almost never, ever saw anyone obese. I remember I saw one large woman in a marketplace selling um, grilled rats on skewers. And she was the first heavy person I'd ever 
really um, met in Thailand. And when I went back the second and third and fourth time, I see more and more uh, larger people and I can buy clothes now anywhere. I can buy, walk into any Thai clothing store, department store, and I can find something that would fit me. In the past, I had to get all my clothes made. So people are getting fatter. And in Thailand, their fast food are becoming, fast food restaurants are becoming more and more prevalent. And they're a sign of um, almost like prosperity. So you walk into a McDonald's, and in Thailand, everyone's in black. They're smoking. Even the women are smoking. It's a high-end thing to go and hang out in McDonald's. And I would tell them, gosh, McDonald's in our country isn't, isn't really a great place to hang out. I'd never hang out there with all my friends. But here it was a real place to show yourself in your stylish back outfit because it's a Western type of industry. More and more people are having money to buy those fast foods. So Asia and the rest of the world, they're becoming fat. The BMIs are have, they're becoming uh, more and more and more. Um, and then uh, let's look at prevention. This is another concept we want to study in global public health where there are multiple contributors to a health problem. There are multiple paths to solution. And I'm sure you've heard this many, many times looking at primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention. Primary, you remember the P for prevention. Secondary is the S for screening. And tertiary is the T for treatment. Um, primary prevention, um, the target is people without diseases, healthy people. And the goal is to prevent the disease from ever occurring. And examples might be um, giving tetanus shots to pregnant women, vitamin A to at-risk at children to prevent blindness, something to keep healthy people healthy. Secondary prevention is really focused on the early diagnosis of, of disease. So the target is people um, with early non-symptomatic diseases. And the goal is to reduce the severity and prevent disability and death. Examples might be mammographies, um, checking blood pressure routinely to detect hypertension. And then tertiary is really treatment and rehabilitation. The target population looking at people with um, symptomatic diseases. And the goal is to reduce impairment and minimize suffering in the individual. And examples might be um, detecting cases of acute respiratory infections in children. So they can be treated with antibiotics or checking for foot problems among people with type 2 diabetes so they don't develop ulcers and have to amputate their legs. And then there's concept, I'm sure you've seen this before in some of your public health classes, um, understanding the causal web surrounding some condition. This is the causal web surrounding heart disease. So what what causes heart disease? You can't just look at one indicator. You have to look at many different things. You have to say, is this individual smoking? What is their cholesterol level like? What is their blood pressure like? Do they have type 2 or type 1 diabetes? What does their diet look like? Are they involved in a stressful job or a stressful situation? What is going on? You have to understand this causal web of indicators that all impact each other to impact a condition. This is another example of our causal web, but this is for infections for diarrhea. So when you look at why a child, a three-year-old child has diabetes, you have to look at a number of different indicators. Are, are their parents educated? What level of education? Do they have um, refrigerators? Do they even have electricity? Are they living in poverty? Do they have a toilet? Is it a Western toilet or an Eastern to toilet? Do they have soap to wash their hands after they use the restroom? Um, all these different indicators. Um, are, is malnutrition an issue? Uh, are other issues prevalent? Um, what's going on in their community? So there are many things that would lead to this, uh, to the diarrhea. It's not just one indicator. So when you look at the population, you have to look at the causal web to understand really why something's going on. Um, I really like this map as well. This looks like the, I'm just trying to open this up here. Um, today, 1.3 billion people live in extreme poverty. 1.3 billion people. And that is defined as people living on less than $1.25 per day. And um, this yellow, which I'm trying to bring over, what are the most, where are the most extreme levels of poverty indicated in the world. And if we look at this color chart on the lower left-hand side, the uh, dark purple indicates areas where uh, people are living in greater than 60% poverty. Then it moves up to the red, 
to the orange, to the yellow, to the blue, and uh, dark blue is less than 10%. So you can see um, all over the world uh, the uh, where people are living in, in poverty. In the gray, of course, where we don't have data in some parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, where just, we're just not, the data may not be collected. But you can tell, once again, we'll be focusing in this area here where there are real challenges, where there's infectious diseases, poverty, and so many health challenges. I wanted to just share with you one of my favorite, favorite physicians and public health um, supermen. His name is Dr. Paul Farmer. If you haven't heard of him, definitely look him up. He's amazing. If you Google his name, you can come up with so many great things, books he's written, articles, uh, learn about his life. Uh, a great book they recommend is a book called Mountains Beyond Mountains by Tracy Kidder. The Quest um, for Do of Dr. Paul Farmer, A Man Who Would Cure the World. And it really highlights Paul Farmer's life and how he became such a crusader in public health. Um, he's an amazing, amazing person. He co-founded this international social, social justice and health organization called Partners in Health. Um, he's known as the man who could cure the world. Just amazing guy in what he does. Um, take a look at either his book or you can look at this YouTube um, link on the bottom to learn more about him. He is amazing, especially in global health. He's fantastic. I also want to share with you, uh, I alluded to this in the first part of this lecture, the Millennium Development Goals. They were created in year 2000. 189 different heads of state got together to um, sign the Millennium Declaration, which established eight goals. There were eight goals, and of these, there were 21 targets. And this was like a framework that had 48 indicators that were used by um, the United Nations to track uh, progress across the world. And the goal was to achieve these goals by these eight goals by the year 2015 and most of them were not were not achieved they're really challenging but it's a great way for the whole world to get together and focus on one goals on one set of goals um, the goals were number one uh, to eradicate extreme poverty and hunger to achieve universal primary education which of course is critical to empowering a society three promote gender equity equality and empower women Four, reduce child mortality. Five, improve maternal health. Six, combat HIV AIDS. Seven, ensure environmental sustainability. And eight, to develop a global partnership for development. And the article, uh, the report here is one of the um, MDG reports. There's many on the United Nations website. There's a website, there's a YouTube down here that um, highlights the eight MDGs but they're really important. They're like the Healthy People 2000 for global health. And uh, looking at where the uh, goals and the targets really focus primarily for the MDGs, they were in Sub-Saharan Africa. As you can see, the areas in red and yellow, those are the areas where we need to focus. And you can see in red, there was no progress on Millennium Development Goals in this, uh, on this so in 2015, in September, September 25th, the um, MDGs were completed and the Sustainable Development Goals, which are SDGs, were instituted. Uh, they're a, uh, they guide policy and funding for the next 15 years, so from 2015 to 2030. And at the United Nations Summit in September, um, the uh, UN world leaders signed the 17 sustainable development goals to end poverty, fight injustice, inequity, and tackle climate change by 2030. And these goals apply to all countries, all countries, both rich and poor countries. And once again, they replace the um, Millennium Development Goals, which most were not achieved. These are the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, and there are 169 targets. They range from ending poverty, hunger, good health and well-being, quality education, gender equity, clean water and sanitation, etc. So these are important goals, and I will allude to them often throughout this semester. The um, SDGs are all health-related, and each goal has a, a number of targets. 
and they're categorized under the five P's, people, planet, prosperity, peace, and partnership. Those are the themes throughout all of these 17 goals. I have two um, links for you. Um, actually, we're just going to skip this slide. <laughs> And then I'd like to share with you uh, some questions. How much? How much money does it cost? How much is one insecticide treated bed net to prevent malaria? An ITN insecticide treated bed net? Um, less than $5 for each bed net. Why aren't they more prevalent in households with mosquitoes that, that carry malaria? It's just $5 per net. How much is a full course of um, malaria treatments? A dollar. And as we saw in our Ali movie earlier in this presentation, how much is the tre treatment for cystomyosis? 20 cents, 20 cents, a mere 20 cents. Why can't we cure these diseases if this is a, the treatment's only 20 cents? How much to train and equip one rural birth attendant? $30. How much is a vitamin A capsule? About four cents. How much is one packet of oil rehydration salts to save a child dying from diarrhea? Six cents, or merely six cents. How much are oil antibiotics to, um, to treat pneumonia? 30 cents. And how much is a full course of childhood um, immunizations, including all healthcare worker salaries and supplies? About $17. That's not much, it's pennies. Then I wanted to share what have been some of our international achievements in global health over the years. Well, we have, we've had many reductions in child mortality in many, many countries on many fronts. There are many vaccine preventable diseases. In many places, we have access to clean, safe water and sanitation. There's um, so many countries with stronger, more, um, more relevant malaria prevention and control, control methods. Um, we have many programs targeting HIV AIDS, tuberculosis control, um, focusing on neglected tropical diseases. We're eradicating many of them. Tobacco control, which is always going to be our challenge. Uh, there's an increased awareness for and response for improving global road safety. Um, except I did have a country, uh, a student uh, in the master's degree program who was from Burkina Faso, and she said, uh, road safety is such an issue and her one goal in life was to do something to help her country to improve road safety and finally improve preparedness and response to global health threats which we are dealing with every single day and then how my question how how do we prevent HIV and STDs in Thailand and these are all successes examples. And I'll let you read through these, but we've had tremendous, tremendous success with reducing um, the number of uh, HIV-infected individuals uh, within Thailand. In Thailand, we've had made tremendous, tremendous improvements in China, uh, controlling tuberculosis with the DOTS program, directly observed therapy, the short course. We've really eliminated polio in the Americas. Um, we've had tremendous success saving uh, mothers' lives, maternal health in Sri Lanka, and controlling trachoma in Morocco, and finally reducing guinea worm in sub-Saharan Africa. We've made tremendous, tremendous strides in reducing guinea worm. I think there are only a few hundred cases now of guinea worm in the world. And then I want to share with you our final video um, entitled The Girl Effect. It's a three-minute video, which I will share with you now. Thank <laughs> you. 
So what did you think of the girl effect? Please take a look at the, their website, thegirleffect.org, for more information on um, this situation. And I have one more video I'd like to share with you. It's four minutes, and it is called It Only Takes One Girl to Make a Difference. And uh, here it is now, and that will be the end of our presentation. Thank <laughs> you.